The whole idea of Pokemon is to form bonds of friendship and trust with these wild creatures as together you defeat countless opponents until you become the champion. But what if I don't want to do that? What if Pokemon were single use? And after one battle, they had to go into the box forever. And to make things more interesting, I'm only catching the first Pokemon on each route, as well as a couple other rules. Is it possible to beat Pokemon under those conditions? Let's see how it goes. After the game tries to trick me into thinking I'm back in Gen 3, I see daylight for the first time in weeks. Being locked in a moving van with a bunch of old junk has awoken in me a hatred of all things used. Whether it be thrift store finds or even Pokemon, I only want new things. And so my room that used to bring me so much joy now feels like a prison. I need to get out of here. And I barge into May's room unannounced as she is apparently getting dressed. Well, that was mighty inappropriate. As I leave Little Root Town, I find a man and his dog working out, and I get to pick a brand new Pokemon fresh off the shelves of the Pokemon factory. I start with Mudkip and defeat this Poochiena. By the way, the additional rules of this run will start to apply after I get Pokeballs, meaning I jump right ahead till I defeat my rival as one grows to level six, which is somewhat confusing. Now that I've gotten Pokeballs, let me explain the rules a bit more. First off, wild Pokemon do not count as using my Pokemon. If they did, I would never get anywhere because to catch a Pokemon, I would first have to use a Pokemon. What I'm referring to are trainer battles. So I get a Wurmple on Route 101 and then a Wingle on Route 103. I'm also attempting to do this by only catching the first Pokemon I see per route, much like a Nuzlocke, but I may have to relax that rule later. I will not, however, catch a Pokemon I've already used. Right after that catch, I have my first real battle against Calvin and his Zigzagoon. In trainer battles, any Pokemon I used is permaboxed as soon as the battle is over, but they are allowed to defeat multiple Pokemon as long as it's in the same battle. Unsurprisingly, my Cascoon does eventually take out the Zigzagoon, and we have the first loss of the run, even though we won. But this Cascoon is quickly replaced with a C dot on Route 102. And I'm doing this run in Hoenn because I know this region fairly well. As I'm trying to have a conversation with my father, this rude Wally kid interrupts us and demands a Pokemon. Uh, since when is that the gym leader's responsibility? Just earn a Pokemon by saving some fat guy like I did. It's not that hard. I catch a Zigzagoon on Route 104, and at this point I won't show every encounter because there are a lot of them. That's the point of this run. Now, I'm not entirely sure how many of these random people are trainers, but just to be safe, I will avoid looking at everyone, which is what I do in real life anyway. But now, sneaking is literally a matter of life and death. And I'm doing a pretty good job in the Petalburg Woods until I encounter a mandatory Team Magma battle. My Zigzagoon does manage to defeat his Puchiena after a few tackles, not a problem. Before continuing with my journey, I need to backtrack to Petalburg to deposit not just my Zigzagoon, but all of my other Pokemon too in a different box. I need to keep these guys separate. After sneaking through the woods again, I make my way to Rustboro City without any more encounters. After all, I can avoid this mandatory battle on the bridge since I now only have a single Pokemon. So naturally, I mock them by dancing right in front of them. Because trust me, nobody wants to see those dance moves. In the Poke Center, this guy sarcastically says that I look rich, which is not even close. Since most of your money in Pokemon comes from trainer battles, something I am desperately avoiding, I am actually quite destitute throughout most of this run, especially because my money has to go to Pokeballs. Thanks for bringing that up, man. After tossing out these Pokeballs I just bought and doing some rare candy training, there is no way I will level up all of these Pokemon legitimately, CDOT evolves. And naturally, I take her to go and fight Roxanne. I did get Mudkip here as a backup, but I was hoping for either a CDOT or a Shroomish before the first gym. Just as a reminder, since my Nuzleaf is able to defeat Roxanne all on her own, she is the only Pokemon who will be used in this battle. Honestly, things are going pretty well right now. Hopefully they don't take a turn for the worst anytime soon. And if you like this video idea, or just Pokemon runs in general, be sure to subscribe and let me know the types of things that you want to see in the future. I do have to sacrifice my Skitty to defeat another Magma Grunt, and I save Pico, the most famous Wingle in the entire world. So. After depositing all of my Pokemon, again, I backtrack over the river and through the woods. To Grandfather's house we go. It's a lot easier to sneak through these woods going the wrong direction. I force this old man, who is probably a grandpa, to take me all the way to Duford Town. It's the least he could do after getting one of my Pokemon murdered. There was only one problem. Remember when I said I knew this game really well? I lied. I do know Gen 3 like nobody's business but have only played Gen 6 Hoenn a single time eight years ago. And so I was expecting the maze gym that I'm used to, 
not this thing. This gym is basically a straight line where there are three mandatory trainer battles before the gym leader. So this is gonna suck. For Laura, she only has one Pokemon, so I use my Wishmer, who will be basically useless in the rest of the gym because he's weak to fighting. But he does defeat this Metatite. The next trainer is Hideki and his Machop, who Taylor defeats in a few wing attacks. It would have been nice to have kept this bird as a backup for Brawly, but twasn't meant to be. The last trainer in the gym, before the gym leader, is Tessa. Her Metatite does pose a problem to my Makuhita, but as you can see, I have very few options left. Thankfully, she spams Detect a couple of times and only hits with a single confusion before falling to Force Paws. The Machoke poses no real problem. I can now face Brawly with a team that is a shadow of its past self. This guy is super into fitness, by the way. I decided to save Wingle for this battle because he is the only one who can defeat Brawly all on his own, which is exactly what happens as he only gets hit by a seismic toss. Just for fun, compare the two Pokemon I currently have, one being a Magikarp, Magikarp, to the ones that I've already lost. I think it's safe to say things are not going great. This run has taken quite a turn for the worst since the last gym. So let's look at some cool rocks to try and cheer me up as Steven longs for the good old days when Pokemon could literally destroy the world. Okay, man. With my new old rod, which I probably shouldn't have used since it's a hand-me-down and I hate used things, I can replenish my team just a bit, getting a few new water Pokemon. My entire team is water right now, so I guess it's a good thing the next gym leader isn't electric or something like that. This is actually the reason I chose Ruby though, because it's a lot easier to defeat Team Magma with the abundance of water Pokemon Hoenn offers, which unfortunately happens right away in the Slateport Museum as I am forced to use Tentacool on this first Grunt and then have to pivot to Goldeen against the second Grunt's Zubat. She does manage to finish him off, but I'm back down to two Pokemon yet again. I was hoping to build up a reserve here. Maxi, seeing the strength of my... Uh, Magikarp, I suppose, is so intimidated that he decides to leave me alone. In the market, I find the man who apparently sold the seaweed to the Paldea auction house, and then this creepy lady pulls me out of the crowd to teach me the ways of contests. Against my better judgment, I decide to try a contest, and am groomed by this lady with an Altaria. Turns out I'm her 100th victim, but this is all for a noble cause, because after my Marsh Tomp ends up losing the contest, I do get a cosplay Pikachu from some other random lady. I am getting so much feminine attention right now, and this Pikachu looks tough. On Route 110, I have another mandatory encounter with Pokefan Isabel. She uses two Pikachu knockoffs, so naturally, my Pikachu knocks them down with a couple of simple moves. And you probably know what's coming next, a rival fight. I'm hoping that the Gulpin I literally just got five seconds ago can do this on her own. She does take out May's Slugma in a couple of hits. Anticipating a rollout, she yawns to put the Willemur to sleep, lowers her special defense with Acid Spray, and then takes her out with two Sludges. Last is the Grovile, but I repeat the same strat to lower her special defense, and then she falls in a single Sludge. After I heal with an Oran Berry, just in case. And we're back down to the same two Pokemon. Fantastic. I get to Mauville City and see the worst sight imaginable. Wally. This guy is going to be a waste of space and block entry to the gym, making me waste a Pokemon. Thankfully, I can head to Route 117, where I end up finding an Illumis who is more than capable of taking out this little Ralts. And you think you're depressed, kid? Look at all the dead Pokemon I already have. Unfortunately, as I enter the gym, my depression becomes super depression because these appear to be mandatory trainer battles. And I don't have any Pokemon to spare. I mean, I do finally decide to use my Gyarados against Kirk the Rockstar, which is a bit risky because of his four times weakness to Electric, but I'm saving Marsh Tomp for obvious reasons. Thanks to a Cherry Berry though, both his Magnemite and the Electric fall in a couple of bites, doing only minimal damage to Gyarados. With his defeat, I am able to move forward and am promptly stopped by another mandatory battle. Well, I only have one Pokemon left, so I guess that means we're at the end of the road. This video is over. Or I can bend the rules a little bit because I'm the boss here. And so I'm going to relax the Nuzlocke rule for a little bit and get a second encounter on a few of the early routes. But I still won't exceed more than two Pokemon per route. Curlia is more than capable of defeating little Ben here. I did accidentally misname her. She should be 17, not one, but I kept track of what she should have been so the numbers are still accurate. For Vivian, I'm taking a bit of a risk using my Diana against her Metatite. Thankfully, she just uses Thunder Punch, so we're all good. For the last battle before Watson, 
I used Shroomish against Sean, though I once again messed up her nickname, this time by not using one. But I kept good enough records, and she is number 16. I was trying to blow through all this nonsense late at night, so I started making some minor and one major mistake, as you'll soon see. With that, I can finally head to Watson, where I lead with the only Pokemon I have left, my trusty Marshtomp, who has been with me since the beginning, but has been a slacker the entire time. But he more than makes up for it in this battle, by mudshotting all of Watson's Pokemon. He had a person berry to cure confusion, just in case. I knew I was saving him for a good reason. You did great, Marshtomp, and now he's dead to me. I don't want no pre-used Pokemon. Now, I should have stopped the session right here, but because this battle went so well, I decided to keep it going. Specifically, I needed some more Pokemon. North of Mauville, as his last act in the run, Marshtomp smashes a rock to find his replacement, a Geodude. Unfortunately, I accidentally walked directly into the path of a completely avoidable trainer. That was a stupid mistake. And I was hoping to save this rock for the Flannery fight too. I mean, Geodude does destroy Irene's picnic, no problem. And by that, I mean he almost dies. But now, I'm back to zero Pokemon. I should have just gone to sleep. The next day, after being somewhat rested, I need to battle Ace Trainer Wilton with the Grimer that I picked up in Fiery Path. And he's doing relatively well, taking out all of this trainer's Pokemon until the Makuhita uses Whirlwind, bringing out the Numel who I got on Route 112. And once again, we are back to zero Pokemon. That was super lame. In Route 113, I catch a Sandshrew who is immediately used against Youngster Neil. It would be nice to have some Pokemon for more than a couple of seconds. Is that too much to ask? Apparently it is, because right after catching a Swablu on Route 114, I have to face Steve the Maniac and his Aeron. I am not confident that Swablu can win this battle, but I have no other Pokemon. I do give Swablu a Lepiberry to make Natural Gift a fighting type, and it still does less than half. Aeron, on the other hand, just straight up kills me, so I black out. That does it. He done messed up. I decide to get a few more encounters by catching a second Pokemon in a couple of the routes nearby. And we're right back to Steve the Maniac. But this time, my Spinda takes him out with two Rock Smashes. That wasn't so hard now was it, Swablu? Before I can enter Meteor Falls, I need to face the hiker, Lenny. Our two virtually identical Machops low sweep each other. He gets a crit, which isn't fair, but mine was apparently faster, so he wins. Speed often trumps strength. Because of the number of battles quickly approaching, I do decide to just get two encounters in Meteor Falls, a Zubat and a Soul Rock. May and I put our differences aside, you know, like the fact that I wasted a Gulpin on her not that long ago, and we decide to take down Team Magma. I don't believe I'll win this battle with a single Pokemon, so I leave with Slugma, because out of my current Pokemon, I hate him the most. And I need him to suck up the Intimidate, as well as this Self-Destruct, which is fine by me. That coughing just killed three Pokemon. What a monster. Golbat and Grovile are able to finish off the battle, but it doesn't really mean anything because they escape a few seconds later as I angrily block Team Aqua from pursuing them for some reason. I don't know why. And now I need to backtrack once again to get a couple more encounters on previously visited routes. I have to be lax about this rule right now because I know what's coming up. Specifically, a number of mandatory battles at Mount Chimney. The first grunt is defeated fairly easily with a Roserade after using a Growth and some Leaf Seeds. Even after using that many Rillies, Tabitha has the gall to call me obnoxious. And to take her down, I finally need to use my Zangoose. I was hoping to save him for a bit, but oh well. The Coughing tries to take me down with him, but to no avail. And the Numel is super simple. You're not a very good fighter, are you Tabitha? I meet up with Maxi again, who is straight up obsessed with dead and ancient Pokemon. Anyway, I start with Voltorb against Maxi's Mightyena. After a screech, Voltorb gets a free attack boost, which is exactly what I was hoping for. A spark still doesn't take him out, and then Voltorb is confused, but for real. Several turns later, without doing any more damage, he kills himself. Well, that was nice. Soul Rock comes out, which sucks, because I wanted to save him for the Flannery fight, but again, I can't do that. Against the Camerupt, he proceeds to get burned from a Lava Plume. This fight is going so well. Even with that burn, he manages to defeat the Camerupt, and then the Golbat who comes out next. But it was still a bad showing, for sure. After our fight, Maxi threatens me with a Mega Evolution, so why didn't he just do that in the first place? After wiping out all of my Pokemon again, 
there are only three more routes where I can get a second encounter, and they end up being a Ninkeda, Abra, and Slackoff. Actually, I did forget about Jagged Path here, so I can get a Spoink as well. Shortly thereafter, Ninkeda evolves, and I get a free Pokemon in the form of Sheninja, who I'm hoping I can be really cheap with. That ability is awesome. I expertly avoid some of the gym trainers here, but there are a few that I can't. For Sadie, I use Spoink, who easily defeats the single Metatite. The next trainer actually uses a fire Pokemon, like they're supposed to in this gym. But my Kadabra easily defeats him too. And those were actually the only mandatory battles here. After being yelled at by this girl, I use an undoubtedly cheap, but simple, method to defeat her. Encore. You see, Flannery loves to set up the sun, so I can force this Slugma to keep using Sunny Day, allowing my Vigoroth to get ripped. The Encore does wear off, but three bulk ups I think should be enough. Slugma tries to burn me as a parting gift, but I was ready for that. Torkoal has great defense, so he won't die, but hopefully I can survive the hit. Or he just uses Sunny Day, allowing me to, once again, make him useless with an Encore. After one more bulk up, Slash takes him out. Last is Numel, who stands no chance. I was concerned about this fight for a while, because Overheat is plenty powerful, but it worked out great. May gives me some goggles, and I decide to catch two Pokemon in the sandy region of Route 111. After all, before I can face my father, I need to defeat three gym trainers once again. In the speed room, I face off against Randall and his Delcat. It takes a while for my Cacturn to actually win, but after a couple of Needle Arms and some Leech Seed, he does it. Next is the Zero Reduction Room with Parker, and this battle does not go well. I thought Baltoy would be stronger than he is, but Psybeam is weak, and Lanoon's furious swiping is not. At one point, he even steals my berry and eats it directly in front of me, like a jerk. So things are not looking good. But when it really matters, Baltoy comes in clutch to dodge the swipes and wins the battle with 10 HP. Last is Jody in the Strength Room, but my Wobbuffet makes short work of her Zangus, even lowering her attack, which was certainly not necessary. And finally, it's on to my father, even though I only have a couple of bugs. My strategy for this fight is basically get a little bit lucky. Ninjask starts with a double team, gets yawned, and proceeds to start a Fury Cutter. This move doubles in strength every turn, as long as he doesn't miss or die. A non-crit retaliate should barely leave me alive, but he doesn't even hit me. And after only three hits, the first slacking is down. Vigoroth falls in a single hit, but even with unlimited power, the stronger slacking survives and knocks Ninjask down to 12 HP. But the almighty Fury Cutter is not stopped, and it takes one more soul. And I am glad that battle is over. It's another one I have not been looking forward to. I get Surf, and I'm planning on catching some new Pokemon, like in that pond right over there, until Wally kidnaps me and drags me all the way to Mauville City. He didn't even ask. I trek all the way back to Petalburg to swim in this water and get a Surfskit. With Surf, there are a few other encounters I can get, but I am promptly interrupted by this guy who loves him some rocks. And while we're talking, or more accurately, he's talking at me, Latias appears to interrupt us and kidnaps me. First Wally, now a legendary Pokemon? Haven't you guys ever heard of consent? We arrive at some exotic island, but rather than relax, Steven jumps me with the help of two of his magma friends. In this battle, I am surprised that a champion level trainer like Steven doesn't have anything better than a level 35 Matang. That's kind of weird. But what do I know? All my Pokemon are single use, which is probably not eco-friendly now that I think about it. A four times effective Bubble Beam does remarkably little to the camera up, but at least his Lava Plume is a bit weaker since it hits multiple Pokemon. For my stunning bravery, Latios joins my team. And don't get me wrong, I really like Latios, but in this run, he's literally just a number to me. Maybe I'll use him later, I haven't yet decided. Jumping ahead to the Weather Institute, this grunt starts with a coughing, and I with a newly caught Gloom. This battle takes a while, because I can't do all that much to him, but Gloom does heal every so often with Moonlight, so it's not too bad. Before I can continue into this building, I realize there is one more route I can go to get another encounter. So I do some surfing, and then a lot of fishing with my trusty Goodrod to get myself a Whalemur. Back in the Weather Institute, I have the last Magma Grunt to face, but I got a Moonstone in Meteor Falls, and Wigglytuff takes out the Numel in a couple of rounds. And after failing to confuse me, the Mightyena falls to a couple of disarming voices. That sounds mighty creepy. 
Now, there is another grunt here, but I avoid her using a ninja move called walk around the table. Now, Tabitha only has a camera up, so basically any water Pokemon could take him out. I decide to use my new whale because he takes way too long to evolve anyway. After she spills the beans on Magma's plans, I get a cast form. I've actually come to like this guy quite a bit more recently. Before I can get to safety, I have another rival battle. Since she is jealous of my Mega Evolution Bling, she tries to take it from me. I have been saving Sharpedo for this battle, who takes out the Slugma super easily. She has a Poison Fang for the Grovile, but it apparently wasn't enough. At least non-lotion skin finishes that job. With her death, I need to decide which Pokemon to sacrifice. I want to save Manectric for the Winona fight, so that means that Sheninja has to come out, which unfortunately means I couldn't use him to stall an entire gym or Elite Four member. That's too bad. On the other side of Fort Tree, I encounter my first horde battle with a ton of Merrells. All right, look at those cute little guys. For some reason, you can't catch any Pokemon in a horde encounter. That makes zero sense to me. If there are that many Merrell in such a small location, wouldn't it be easier to throw a Pokeball and hit something? Oh well, time to kill them and leave only a single survivor. This is what you've made me do, game. Believe it or not, for the first time since Roxanne, I can actually get to Winona without wasting my precious Pokemon resources on lame gym trainers. Granted, it means I need to take things slow and careful, but I actually do manage to do it. This means I get to use Manectric in the gym battle. The Swellow hits with a wing attack. That is pretty weak. Altaria has an earthquake, but a simple Shucka Berry, stolen from some dude's berry field, decreases ground damage, allowing Manectric to tank the hit and knock out the Altaria. Neither of her last two Pokemon, Pelipper or Skarmory, can survive a single discharge. So that's it. It's convenient that you can find an Electric just a few routes before this gym. On Route 120, again, just look at how awesome that pond is at night. Looking at that water, I can see into the infinite expanse of space, even though it's only reflection in a video game. That's pretty cool. Now, on Route 121, there is another mandatory battle. Or is there? There should be a way to avoid this lady, which I'm going to try because I don't have Pokemon to spare. Though I do get a few encounters on these routes, I am quickly going to lose most of them. After getting a Duskull, I catch a Metatite on the top of Mount Pyre, which is technically the same area as inside the mount, but I'ma let it slide. And that's not just because I happen to love a pure power Metachamp. And with that, I have more Pokemon than can fit on my team. Has that ever happened in this run? Unfortunately, on top of Mount Pyre, I have a number of mandatory battles, so it's not going to last. The first grunt has a coughing, who realizes his inevitable death and just gives in, doing nothing to my bayonet. Good job. For the second grunt, I use Kecleon to dig the Numel, and then use a hidden power, that just so happens to be Bug, for the Mighty Yenna. The third grunt also has a Mighty Yenna, and I use Cast Form to set up the hail. I can heal the first confusion, but not the second one. Still, it all works out okay, as this dog and then the bat both fall to an ice weather ball. Cast form was my plan B for the Winona fight, by the way, using the same basic strategy. On the summit of Mount Pyre, we find out where Maxi ran off to all those gems ago. What has taken him so long to get here? He steals a red orb, and then I scare him off, leaving me to fight the robot, Courtney. But like always, I only need a single water type because these admins all use camera ups. So Golduck takes it out. Get some variety, guys. For some reason, these old peeps all of a sudden trust me with the precious blue orb, and they ask me to track down the red one. So I head to Slateport, because that's where Maxi told me to go. And there he is, attempting to steal a submarine. And by attempting, I mean he totally does it. Even after that daring escape, two of his grunts try to beat me up and stall for time. My unnumbered Crawdunt takes out the Mightyena in just a couple of hits, but I can't change around my team for the next battle, meaning I need to pivot to Dusclops on the Numel, who only uses a takedown. A few punches takes out the Camel, and then a few Rock Tombs for the Bat. And just like that, we're back down to basically no Pokemon. It was fun while it lasted. However, the man I just failed to help takes me all the way to Lily Cove. This means I effectively bypassed that supposed mandatory battle. I do have to return to Slateport right away though, because I need to change this Crawdon's number before shoving him into the box forever. I don't want to lose track of my numbers here. It's funny that the only two Pokemon I currently have, Metacham and Azumarill, both have awesome abilities that double their attack. Then again, it kinda sucks, because I need to waste one of them here with the rival fight. 
I'm hoping to save Metacham for later, so Azumarill it is. Thankfully, this is the last rival battle, and Azumarill is an adorable beast. He one-shots Maze Pokemon with either an Aqua Tail or Play Rough. Good thing none of them miss too. The Waylord does take two hits, but it doesn't really matter. Before I can escape to the Great Wide Ocean, where there are several more encounters, I need to clear the Magma Base first. And I seriously doubt I can do this with a single Pokemon, as awesome as she may be. So, I return to the Safari Zone, where I did get a Psyduck in Area 1, but you see how the possible encounters change as you cross different areas? Well, I'ma now allow myself to get one Pokemon in each of the other three areas. In my mind at least, this is better than getting three encounters on normal routes. For the first grunt in this hideout, I need to use Pinsir. I do feel bad wasting her on a Mightyena, because I've grown to really like Pinsir, but I'd rather she not face camera ups. Because you know, they all have them. Conveniently, the Magma guys give me a free Electrode, who will be very shortly put to good use. I actually shouldn't have gotten this guy here, because I already did use a Voltorb, but I totally spaced it during the run, so I break this very important rule. I'm sorry guys, I apparently didn't keep as good records as I thought. Another Grunt challenges my Rhyhorn, but he very quickly loses. These Magma Grunts then realize that I can't be beaten so easily. So, naturally, they throw a ton of level 18 Puchienas at me. This is the epitome of quantity before quality. Because I don't want to waste time here, Electrode sacrifices himself to save me just a couple of minutes. In a perfect world, I would have kept Electrode for the Wallace Gym Leader battle, but there was no way he was going to last two gyms. Self-Destruct is just too tempting for single-use Pokemon. The last battle in this hideout is against none other than the computer Courtney. She has a camera up. Surprise, surprise, but I don't have any water types anymore, so I choose Dodrio. But the battle is not all that exciting because the camera up tries to put me to sleep. I decline and take him out with a couple of plucks. Even though that was a relatively fast battle, I still somehow manage to lose Maxi as he once again narrowly avoids my grasp. It's not all bad though, because now I can finally explore the oceans and catch all of these water Pokemon if I can learn how to use a super rod. The twin gym has completely avoidable trainers, so I can use my two new encounters right here. They only have two Pokemon, so this shouldn't be too bad, right? I start with a rain dance and hope that Lunatone doesn't use light screen, which means he obviously will. After a few surfs, Corsula survives a solar beam with five whole HP as Love Disc falls to a psychic but Corsula's last surf is enough to take out the two rocks. With two water types, I expected that to be much easier. I was only 5 HP away from wasting two more Pokemon. Steven, the man with the steel Pokemon, has the dive HM for some reason, but I'm not complaining, because under the sea, I can get several more Pokemon to replenish my Pokestash. I find the camera up submarine, which doesn't make a ton of sense, because as we've learned in this run, even a tiny drop of water can take out the ground fire camel. And for the last time, I need to thwart Team Magma's plans. Fortunately, there is only a single Magma Grunt here that I need to face, and my Clam Pearl takes out the Mightyena and the Weezing in just a couple of surfs. Now it's on to Maxi. Archie is here too, but he doesn't feel like helping me save the world or something, I don't know. This battle is a one-on-one. -on -one. My Cradley uses several ancient powers to take out the Mightyena. I was hoping for the Omni Boost here, but I didn't get one. The Weezing is scared of this ancient plant and decides to blow up, but Cradley survives. Not for much longer, however, because the Crobat almost kills him with a single acrobatics, takes an ancient power, and then does knock him out. I send out Cedra, who takes an acrobatics and does basically nothing with that surf. Are you kidding me? That was so weak. He barely survives another hit and finally does take out the Crobat. This is not going well. The camera up Mega Evolves but Cedra does manage to take him out with a surf. It's a good thing it crit because as we just saw, this Cedra apparently sucks. After my victory, Archie runs away, instead of trying to stop Maxi from holding up a red orb. Since Maxi has no more Pokemon, couldn't we just, you know, attack him with ours? We could stop him that way. Zero is too good a person for that, apparently, meaning that the super ancient Pokemon wakes up, jumps into the sky, creating a lava platform, and decides to head to Sutopolis. Outside of our little cave, Maxi discovers that things do indeed get hot when the sun comes out. Thought that was obvious, but I guess I'm just a kid. I can't get the last badge in Sutopolis because the gym is closed. I wish I could take a day off at my job just because it's hot, 
but I don't even know the meaning of true heat until I enter the Cave of Origins and jump on Groudon's back just because Arch Nemesis Maxi told me to. This seems like a horrible idea, but not as horrible as taking off your protective suit in the middle of a freaking volcano. Using a Master Ball, I catch this super ancient primal Pokemon, or as I like to call him, 62. With that, I have successfully saved the world, and we see a bunch of people, who I don't care about at all, all across the Hoenn region begin to worship me as their salvation. Turns out, my method of single-use Pokemon is good enough. Steven gives me the Eon Flute, which lets me fly around on the back of Latios. And then, I decide to show you how full my PC actually is. Because with those most recent deaths, Box 2 and 1 are completely packed. So, I have to start putting new Pokemon into Box 3. With the Eon Flute and Groudon Reawakened, there are several more encounters I can get. For example, the Mirage Islands have a ton of new Pokemon like Darmanitan. I can also return to a few routes where I only caught a single Pokemon and get new hidden Pokemon. I'm not entirely sure how you sneak up on a fish while swimming in the water, but somehow it works, I suppose. And finally, we can face off against Wallace. He also has no mandatory battles as long as you can walk on ice. Lantern starts off the battle by eventually electrocuting the Love Disc after he falls in love twice and gets confused. Well, that was a great start. This baits out Wishcash, and so for perhaps the first time in the run, I intentionally swap Pokemon to bring out the wannabe evolved form of Love Disc. Seems really weird that he isn't, to be honest. He starts with an Aqua Ring to heal a bit every turn, and slowly, oh so slowly, takes away the Wishcash's health. He does have Wish too, so with how little Earthquake is doing, I am totally going to win. After he falls, the Celio is much faster, as I use a super effective wake up slap. I guess I'm slapping with my fin or something? The Sea King tries to copy my Aqua Ring plan, but this fish is not as bulky as my fish. Last is Melotic, and fairly quickly, my secret power paralyzes her. Unfortunately, it does very little damage, and she can heal all of it with recover. So, I use a Wish, pivot back to Lantern, heal the Hydro Pump damage, and finish off the battle with a couple of Discharges. I wish I didn't have to use two Pokemon for that battle, but it looked like the safest option. After getting a few more sneaking encounters, I am ready to head to Victory Road. The first battle is with Hope, who uses a Frostlass, so I figured I should go for Magmar. Unfortunately, I didn't think he would confuse me, because I'm an idiot sometimes, and Magmar barely makes it out of that battle alive. That was close. The next trainer is hiding in the dark like a weirdo. Brian, if that is his real name, has fighting Pokemon, so I use my Parasect. I mean, I don't do all that much, but I do get a Fury Cutter going, and I take out this top. The throw is a bit bulkier, and I fairly quickly miss a Fury Cutter. So, I swap to Spore instead, and then just Giga Drain. Things are going fine until he's at Death's Door, and then he circle throws me right out of the battle. So, that was very frustrating. I didn't want to waste my Mawile here, but I have no choice now. Thanks a lot. And then Edgar decides to taunt me by sending out his Mawile. What a jerk. My Shellos teaches him a lesson. Now, avoiding this double battle is doable, but it's pretty tricky. You see, what you gotta do is swim directly in front of them. Pretty good secret, huh? Theodore, however, is not so easily tricked. I use Murkrow against his Sock, and he just uses Bulk Up, and then Endure. I didn't realize Murkrow could learn Psychic, but I decide to use it here, because why not? Soon after, I encounter another double battle. This one technically could be avoided if you had only a single Pokemon. The only problem is, they would need to know all of these HMs, and they'd have to be the only one you use for Wally. But that does not sound fun, so don't try it at home. I sure as heck didn't. The last region of Victory Road is such a calming, Zen Garden-like place. Just when I think I'm home free, bam, sick kid right in my face, ruining my inner peace, talking to me, of all things. Naturally, I get enraged and decide to decimate him in the most spectacular way possible, with a Mega Latios. And it wasn't that spectacular, because Altaria survived the first hit. The Delcati falls in a single hit, but the Magneton has Sturdy, so I break it with a Dragon Breath and then use Psychic. The Roselia falls to a Psychic, the Mega Gallade does not. Thankfully, he doesn't crit me, meaning I can save Metacham for the Elite Four, which has actually been my plan all along. Speaking of, 
After crushing Wally's dreams yet again, I need to get some more Pokemon before I'm ready to finish my journey. Now you might think that after all of these encounters and dead Pokemon, I've been left with the dregs of society. And you would be partially correct. But there are still a few good Pokemon here and there, so let's give it a shot. I'm not showing you who I catch by the way, because I want it to be a surprise. So with my last six mystery Pokemon, I enter the Pokemon League. And for those of you who can't do math good, the four Elite Four members plus the champion is a total of five battles. I've built my team to use only a single Pokemon per battle, with my sixth guy being a backup. Let's see how it goes. Sydney has been standing in this same room since Generation 3, so they finally gave him a chair to stop him from complaining. I decided to catch a Heracross for this battle, and thankfully she has Guts, which obviously means she comes in pre-burned, which effectively cancels out the Mighty and is Intimidate. Heracross uses a Brick Break against him, and then the Absol who comes out next. Shiftree does manage to flinch her with a fake out, and then the Sharpedo's rough skin hurts her as well, but she survives it all, including the burn damage with 18 HP. To end on a high note, she absolutely wrecks the Cacturn by Mega Evolving and using a close combat. I probably should have given her a Shell Bell or something because she got a bit close to dying, but it was totally worth it to use a Mega Heracross for a single Pokemon. Next, we move on to face Phoebe, who is way too upbeat to be a Ghost Trainer. Since she is so busy dancing around, I'll take the chair this time. I decided to get an Absol, who is a Pokemon I really like, but hardly get a chance to use. He starts with a Swords Dance, cures the Confusion, and then begins a Night Slash Sweep. The only time she's hit in this battle is, once again, because of a Fake Out from the Sableye. The rest of the match is fairly simple. Then it's on to Glacia, who is the trainer that my Metacham has been waiting to fight all this time. I mean, she's only number 50, and I'm in the 70s by now. Either way, she blows through Glacia's team using either a Fire Punch or a Brick Break. Heracross and Metacham could have swapped places, but it didn't really matter who faced who. The last Elite Four member is Drake and his dragons. I decided to get a Togekiss for this fight. The only problem is that he has Hustle, lowering his accuracy. I'm trying to compensate with a wide lens, by the way. After seeing that this guy had Hustle, I did consider catching a different Pokemon to take his place, but the whole point of this run is to minimize the number of Pokemon that I catch, and since he was already numbered, I had to use him. I do have a plan B for when Togekiss inevitably misses and dies. And he doesn't start off very strong because he fails to one-shot the Altaria even with the Hustle Boost. Come on, but all she does is fluff up her cotton and falls in two more hits. The Kingdra, and then the two twin sibling Flygons, all do what they're supposed to, and die. Togekiss is doing alright so far. Last is Drake's intimidating Salamence, who is also hit by a Dazzling Gleam. I did not expect to get through that battle without missing at all. That was awesome. And with that, we're on to the battle against Steven, with his Steel, Ground, Rock Pokemon. Make up your mind, man. For this fight, I have chosen the beautiful and majestic Walbrain. Just look at the size of those gorgeous teeth. He was actually my plan B for the Drake fight, by the way. If I got a bad ability for the Togekiss, I hit the jackpot here, getting Ice Body. So, after setting up the Hail, she starts using the now 100% accurate Blizzard. The Hail damage has the added benefit of breaking Aggron Sturdy as I protect to waste a turn, then drown the Steel Dragon Lizard thing. His Ancient Plant falls to a Blizzard, as the Hail stops with a Clay Doll. But I don't actually need it, and I also didn't need a crit. Against Armaldo, I take the time to set up the hail once again, letting him hit me, and finally allowing my ice body to actually do something. A Surf next turn takes him out, heals me with a Shell Bell, and levels me up. Last is the Metagross who Mega Evolves, but I outspeed on the first turn because his base speed stat was used, not the Mega Evolved form. I had hoped that two Surfs with the hail damage would take him out, but it looks like it won't. I, on the other hand, take an awful lot from Giga Impact. After another Surf, Metagross hangs on with a sliver of HP, so maybe a few turns of Hail could have taken him out. Either way, Walrein takes out Steven's last Pokemon, as I become the rightful champion of the Hoenn region. Too bad I only have one Pokemon left. You probably already know who it is, but in case you don't, no worries, because after the credits roll, May demands one last battle. Does she truly think she can defeat me? After showing how powerful I am? 
Because I couldn't change my team around, I need to pivot to my real last Pokemon, Groudon. But not just any old Groudon, THE old Groudon, in his primal form. This guy lava plumes the Swellow, and then earthquakes through most of May's team. He is also 10 levels higher, so I'm sure that helps. The Sceptile mega evolves to gain the Dragon type, making Lava Plume do neutral damage. But it still takes her out because I'm using a freaking Ancient Groudon. And now the run is officially over. I did briefly consider doing the Delta episode after this, but this video has been long enough, and trust me, the run took an awful long time. It's actually a lot harder than I thought it was to keep track of 74, or 75 if you count Shininja, Pokemon. And that is the highest Pokemon body count I've ever had in a run. And according to the Oras expert, which is this random guy I found on Reddit, there are a total of 64 mandatory encounters. 62 if you exclude the two wild Pokemon. Keep in mind though, that a few of those battles were double battles, so they took more than one Pokemon. Overall, this run was something that I thought would be really unique, and I hope you appreciated it. Like I said earlier, let me know in the comments which of the Pokemon I used was your favorite. Also, let me know if there was a Hoenn Pokemon you didn't see that you wish you had. Granted, every Pokemon was only shown for like 10 seconds, but hey, we still have our favorites. If you want to see something like this continue in the future, where I do another run but in a different region, go ahead and let me know, and if there's enough interest, I'll probably do a poll and ask you all what I should do next. But again, this takes a long time to do, so don't expect anything in the immediate future. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next region.